Uh, hi again, everybody. Uh, we have a packed evening uh, this evening, and uh, we're really excited, and I hope you're excited that this is our, we're excited to host our first, uh, and uh, first one of hopefully many more public speaking, or public speakers series on animal behavior and welfare. So I'm very excited, I hope you're excited. Our first guest uh, in our series is uh, Shirag Patel, and if you haven't heard him speak before, you're in for a treat. Uh, I'll read a little bit about him, and hopefully I can do him some justice. Shrag has taught uh, many different types of uh, animals, from chickens to whales. He's uh, asked to speak around the world uh, at uh, various organizations. He's uh, hired by people, uh, private clients around the world, and flown to places like Saudi Arabia to train one dog. <laughs> the, the pictures, I mean, to me, you look like you're playing with a dog, but I know you're working. <laughs> Shrag consults on the behavior management and training of domestic animals kept as pets, exotics, zoos, or zoo and laboratory animals. His passion is the application of behavior change science and the ethics to improve the life of, Kim, I mean, animals, L living under human care, especially applying training principles to teach animals to be active participants in their own daily and veterinary care in a stress-free manner, which is what we're all about, so it's amazing. Among his many accomplishments, Shreg is now a star of a new BBC show called Nightmare Pets SOS. Very, very excited. It's, a, it's an awesome show. Uh, Shreg has a website, amazing website with great uh, videos, how-to videos on there. He has a CD. Uh, he, uh, what else? Is that it, Shreg? I think that's it. That's enough? Yeah? Okay. Uh, before I, I'll stop talking and we'll bring Chirag up. Uh, I'm really excited because you're going to really enjoy this if you haven't seen Chirag speak. And when you get to see him with the dogs and work with them, it's just, it's like magic. And we know it's not magic, so. Chirag? It's science. It is science. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, Kim. Um, I have got my phone in front of me, but it's not because I'm busy on Facebook or something while I'm talking to you. It is my pointer to control the slides, so that's the reason for the phone. I do have to say it's a huge pleasure to be here at the SPCA or with the SPCA and in Vancouver. Um, I've had the opportunity to be here um, three other times previously. And I remember when Kim contacted me originally asking if I'd come and do some talks and um, do some work with the SPCA. And it introduced me to the organization and the work that they do. And I, I'm honored and a privilege to be able to travel to lots of different places and be able to teach with lots of different organizations. And I have to say, this is one of my favorites to come to. And I say that genuinely because um, you meet such wonderful people here and the aims of the organization and the investment that they make to improve the lives of the animals that they care for, but also animals in society. And lots of organizations invest in um, maybe bringing more animals into their shelters, whereas the SPCA here are looking at ways to help the community. And just to meet someone like Kim, who, if you've not had a chance to interact with, I would say she's just one of the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. And the amount of work that she does um, is just phenomenal, and I wonder how she does that. Um, so um, it is a huge pleasure to be here. So I think I'm going to need um, your help, Lynn. So we'll go to the next slide, as this is not working. <laughs> So, today we're going to talk about 10 things your dog wished you knew. Now, obviously, there's a slight bias here, and the bias will be, it's my opinion, um, because I sadly can't talk to dogs as much as I would love to. Um, I can't talk to them. But I'm going to share with you what I feel that dogs wish that we knew. Thank you. So, the first one is, I am a dog. Now, this sounds very obvious. But how many times when we've got a pet dog or we're going to get a dog, we've got all these expectations in our mind? Whether those expectations are, I'm going to get this puppy and they're going to be the best puppy, I'm going to be able to take them on all these walks, I'm going to meet new people, or it could be that we don't have any children and so we're going to get a dog to fulfill that role of a substitute child. We might get a dog because we want to go into hospitals and help people. And so we're going to go into hospitals with terminally um, ill children or elderly people, and we're going to take our pet in there to be a therapy dog. 
we might want a sports dog or a guide dog or a police dog. And so before we actually get our dog, we've already put all these expectations on the dog. And sometimes we set them up to fail because when the dog arrives, we start judging the dog with this imaginary dog that we've got in our head. And what we actually do is forget that we're actually working and living with a dog. And so um, I like to remember when I'm working with them is let's look at the dog in front of us as opposed to the dog that's in our mind. Thank you. And so if we look at um, a number of years ago, <laughs> and people laugh, and we see these, and people post these things. I chewed my mum's brand new car, $500 in damage, bad dog. And if we look at the dog's face, and hopefully you'll learn later on today, that that dog's facial expression suggests that the dog is uncomfortable. Um, if we look at the Weimarana in the middle, my favorite pastime is shoving my um, nose in crutches and butts. But again, that's just what dogs do. But we're, as humans living with dogs, we get pleasure, or some people get pleasure, by what they call dog shaming. But we actually love our dogs and we want to live with them. But we actually see these things that dogs do um, as normal dog behaviors, as maybe bad dog behaviors, because we forget that they're dogs. Thank you. So this was my version with one of my previous dogs, Kane, who taught me so much. And so Kane has a message. And Kane's message is, you blame me for behaving like a dog, but maybe because that's because I am a dog. And so um, one of the things I think we have to remember is sometimes we forget that the animals that we're working and living with are pet dogs and are working dogs. But at the end of the day, they're dogs. And we have to treat them like dogs and let them be dogs because they're not robots. And so we need to respect them as what they are. Thank you. And so um, I'd like to leave you with this quote. Based, um, is See the dog in front of you, not the one in our mind. Thank you. Now, dogs are amazing animals. And often when we're working with them or living with them, um, we see things with our eyes. Dogs are able to see things with their eyes too. But actually for dogs, their most powerful sense is their sense of smell. And it's amazing how powerful this sense of smell is. So I'm going to show you a short video clip that really illustrates how powerful a dog's sense of smell is. Hi, Bob. Morning, Kelly. The tulips look great. Have you ever wondered how your dog experiences the world? Here's what she sees. Not terribly interesting. But what she smells, that's a totally different story. And it begins at her wonderfully developed nose. As your dog catches the first hints of fresh air, her nose's moist, spongy outside helps capture any sense the breeze carries. The ability to smell separately with each nostril, smelling in stereo, helps to determine the direction of the smell's source so that within the first few moments of sniffing, the dog starts to become aware of not just what kinds of things are out there, but also where they're located. As air enters the nose, a small fold of tissue divides it into two separate folds, one for breathing and one just for smelling. This second airflow enters a region filled with highly specialized olfactory receptor cells, several hundred millions of them, compared to our five million. And unlike our clumsy way of breathing in and out through the same passage, dogs exhale through slits at the side of their nose, creating swirls of air that help draw in new odor molecules and allow odor concentration to build up over multiple sniffs. But all that impressive nasal architecture wouldn't be much help without something to process the loads of information the nose scoops up. And it turns out that the olfactory system dedicated to processing smells takes up many times more relative brain area in dogs than in humans. All of this allows dogs to distinguish and remember a staggering variety of specific scents at concentrations up to 100 million times less than what our noses can detect. If you can smell a spritz of perfume in a small room, a dog would have no trouble smelling it in an enclosed stadium and distinguishing its ingredients to boot. And everything in the street, every passing person or car, any contents of the neighbor's trash, each type of tree, and all the birds and insects in it has a distinct odor profile telling your dog what it is, where it is, and which direction it's moving in. 
And we think um, that, oh, we see everything um, better than dogs sometimes, but how wonderful is it that they can see the world in so many different ways? Um, and they're picking up information that we would never be able to pick up. And so when we take our dogs for a walk and we leave the house, imagine all that information that's being bombarded towards the dog. And almost the way I describe it to my clients is when you're taking your dog for a walk, there's lots of stories. And so you leave your house and there's a story, that, um, the daily story in the newspaper. And then when you take another step, there's another story. And sometimes when we take our dogs for a walk, we walk at human pace. So what happens is we're sticking these stories in their faces. And then before they've had a chance to read, we're turning the next page. And um, when, if I gave you a book and you're looking at the book or looking at the pictures and before you'd finished, I kept turning the pages, um, that could be quite frustrating. So imagine for our dogs how frustrating it can be when they go to a new environment and we say, let's go. And the dog's like, whoa, whoa wait, there's all these stories that I need to look to and listen to and sniff. And so when you walk your dogs, one of the top tips that I have is I leave my house and the first thing I do is just stand still. And my dog goes, oh, let me pick up all the daily stories today. Mr. Fox went by at four o'clock, and then Mr. Cat went by at two o'clock, and um, my friend walked by here, and then Mr. Smith walked at this time, and then we stand, so my dog's like, okay, I'm done now, can we move on? And I was like, sure, where would you like to go? And my dog says, well, today I'd like to go left. So I was like, sure, let's go left. And then we go left. Yep, that's left. Um, then we go left. And then my dog decides, okay, we're going to read the story a bit more. Then we're going to go right. And it, the walk is always wonderful because I never know where we're going to go. But often when we think about walking dogs, we think that we just need to move. And for dogs, walking has many different functions. One of them is exercise. But actually, dogs don't need as much physical exercise as we think they need. And if we give them lots of physical exercise, it's like taking them for long workouts at the gym. They just get stronger and stronger, so we need to give them more and more workouts. But actually, what they need is they want to leave the house and just sniff and look at see what's going on. And I'll give you guys a little challenge. I want you to go home. I want you to leave your house not have any expectations, do some meditation, breathe in, relax, just watch your dog, let your dog sniff. When your dog says, why are we just standing here, ask them which way they want to go, take a step, stand still again, and then when you run out of time, just go back home. And I will make you a promise. The promise is, when you get home, your dog will be just as tired, if not more tired, from that walk. And some of my clients will actually say, he didn't even wake up later in the afternoon for his second walk. And then they love this way of walking their dogs. So I want you to go home and give this a go and see how much your dogs enjoy it. Okay, so has anyone in this room experienced some kind of pain? Yeah, a number of us have. And so one of the things I like to remember, and I think our dogs want us to remember, is that dogs can feel pain too. And we often think, well, the dog's not shouting or screaming. So maybe he's fine, or this dog is running along, and we think, he's running, he can't be in pain. But how many of us, when we're functioning on adrenaline, will do things that might be painful in other situations? And so I'd like us to remember that sometimes, if our dogs don't want to get off the furniture, and they growl when we ask them to get off the furniture, is he being stubborn, or is he saying, I've got arthritis, and the sofa is way more comfortable than the hard floor? Uh, maybe you've got a dog and you're walking down the street and the dog keeps lying down as opposed to walking with you. Maybe the dog's not being stubborn, but they've got bad hips. And so when our dogs show us certain problem behaviors, um, rather than just saying, well, he's just being stubborn or he's just being naughty, we need to think, how does pain influence behavior? And so if dogs growl at us, sometimes I remember seeing a case where the client said, he's just started growling at the children. We need to, um, we need to rehome him or we may need to re-euthanize him. And then when we went and looked at the dog and we sent the dog to the vets, he had a grass seed in his ear. And so hands coming towards his ear were really painful. And so he would growl. But that's because he was in pain. And so dogs don't do things because they're stubborn or they're naughty. There's often a reason. And one of those reasons can include pain. So when you're living with your dogs, just keep asking the question, is my dog slightly slower today? Does he walk in a, with an abnormal gait? And if he walks slightly abnormally in his gait, then that might be something that affects his behavior. But it's something we should always remember. Thank you. 
And um, there's so many um, neat studies about dogs coming out. And it's great because it shows that we respect dogs, we want to learn more about them. But the science is showing us lots of information. And one of them is from the University of Lincoln. And actually one of my friends and colleagues who's here with us today is one of the authors on this paper, Lynn. And they found that there was um, links with noise sensitivity and dogs who had pain. So we would think, well, my dog is slightly sensitive to sounds, maybe thunder, lightning, other noises. We wouldn't necessarily correlate that or link that with pain. But actually, the science is showing us when dogs show those behaviors, then there could be, it's not just that they're scared. That fear or response may have other things go, um, attached to it. And it could be due to them having some kind of pain or discomfort. Thank you. Um, one of the other things I think our dogs want us to know is that they love companionship. Now, dogs will love companionship on a different level, and different dogs, each dog's an individual. There are times when I love being around my friends and family. There are times when I like to be by myself, and that's the same with our dogs. But I think one of the things we should remember is that when we talk about companionship, how does that look from a dog's point of view? So when I watch wild dogs or um, domestic dogs, I watch wolves or different animals, and you watch how they interact with each other, how many people have ever seen a dog walk up to another dog and pat the other dog on the head? <laughs> I've never seen that. But how many times when we think about companionship do we pull our dog in and cuddle them? And what's our dog actually thinking or saying? Now, thinking, I don't know. But I can watch their behavior. And often when I see that is we'll see dogs who maybe have their pupils dilated or their eyes have got bigger. Or maybe they're pulling their body away slightly. Many dogs, actually, if we watch their behavior, if we stick our camera phones on, the next time you interact with your dog, stick your phone on, go up to your dog, do your normal petting behaviors, or do what you do, and then go back to the camera and just watch. And you might be surprised to go, oh, when I watched it on camera, I realized my dog's actually pulling away slightly. I didn't realize that when I was doing that um, in person. And so, so many dogs actually find it um, aversive and punishing when we stick our hands down and tap them or we try to cuddle them. They actually go, I like to be with you. And companionship could be just sitting together watching a movie, but just keep your hands to yourself, thank you. <laughs> when I'm ready, and I'd like to be touched, I'll give you that information. And that's okay. Sometimes people say, but, Chirag, dogs are domesticated. That's the big difference between wolves and dogs. Um, with, with dogs, you can touch them. But I'm a human, and I've um, um, been, uh, evolved to live around other humans. But that still doesn't prepare me to know how every single hand in this room is going to feel. If you go for a massage, and you have three different massage therapists at three different times you have different massages. You might have three therapists in one go. But each of their hands are going to feel different. And so how can we expect our dogs to be born knowing how every single human hand is going to feel? So domestication doesn't set dogs up to be touched. It sets them up to be pro-social towards people and being close to proximities. But they still need to learn how humans' hands are going to feel. So we may think of touching dogs as normal behavior, and if we touch our dog and they growl, we think, oh, there's a problem with the dog. But often, I would argue, there's no problem with the dog. The dog is just a dog, and it being normal dog behavior. Maybe we have the problem. We just need to slow down slightly and say, we just need to teach this dog how um, human hands feel, and it's good to be touched, or good things happen. And if the dog says, no, thank you, that's their right. We have to respect that. And so I think we have to listen to our dogs. And when we say, well, I should just be able to pick my dog up, my question is why? It's a living being that has emotions, feelings, thoughts. Why should we just be able to do whatever we want with them? Because they don't really have a choice or um, choose to live with us in the first place. Thank you. And so a friend of mine, Sarah Fisher, and a trainer in the UK says, most dogs seek, uh, seek companionship, not contact. And I love that quote because I know my dog will come up, jump on the couch, sit next to me, but he doesn't want my hands on him. He just wants to chill out and watch a movie together. And that's completely fine. And when I was working with some wolf pups last year, the wolf pups would go up to each other and go to sleep with their siblings. But you see, sometimes they go to sleep and they're just nose to nose enough that when they exhale and inhale, the breath is touching each other. Or they go to sleep and the tip of the tail is touching the other wolf cub and then the other wolf cub is sleeping here and the nose is touching this dog's tail. But they want companionship, but they don't want the other wolf jumping on them and sleeping on top of them. 
And so just think when we're with our dogs that sometimes they just may want to say, hold on a sec, let's just watch a movie together or just watch sports together and we just sit and chill. <laughs> Thank you. So the way I think about living with dogs and I think what our dogs want us to know is that we live as a family. And how many of us have heard that dogs live in packs and we have to be the alpha, we have to be the pack leader? That's what I used to think. When I started training, I was taught, I had a German Shepherd cane that you saw in the uh, picture there. Walking him down the street, I was quite young, walking him down the street, we walked down and I was surprised when he grabbed hold of a guy's arm and starts biting the guy. And I was like, oh my God, what have we got? We've got the seven month old German Shepherd who's biting people. And so I took him to training classes, and the ex-police training class, we used a choke chain, we had to walk out of doors before him, we had to um, give him correction and show him who's boss. And that's how I was taught that um, dogs live, and so we have to do that. But is that really true? Well, here's a um, short video clip from a professional who's worked a lot with wolves, and this is what he has to say about this. Uh, the term alpha is, um, isn't really accurate when uh, describing most of the um, leaders of, of wolf packs uh, because uh, it implies, the term implies uh, that uh, the wolves fought and um, competed strongly to get to the top of the pack. In actuality, the way they get there is merely by mating with a member of the opposite sex, uh, producing a bunch of offspring, which are the rest of the pack then, and uh, becoming the natural leaders that way, just like with a pair of humans producing a family. Instead of using the term alpha for a wolf, instead of saying alpha male or alpha female, uh, scientists now tend to call wolves like that the breeding male and the breeding female. And, um, or you can call them the mother wolf and the father wolf. There's really nothing wrong with that. Uh, those are much better and more accurate terms than the term alpha. Actually, um, you know, I'm uh, very much to blame for the term alpha being used with wolves. Um, I published a book in 1970 that now has over 110,000 copies in circulation, and in that I labeled the top uh, wolf in the pack the alpha. And I did that because at that time that's all that science knew. But uh, we've learned a lot. That, pub that book was published in 1970, and in the 35 years since that time, uh, we've learned an awful lot. One of the things we've learned is that the term alpha is really uh, incorrect when applied to most uh, wolf pack leaders. It's, a, it's appropriate to use the term alpha uh, in an artificial pack where, uh, you know, you might put many wolves um, from different assemblages together, unrelated wolves and that kind of thing. Then they would form a pecking order or, or a dominance hierarchy and, and you could call the top animal at that point the alpha. But that, that rarely happens in the wild, if ever. And um, so, you know, that would be one case where you could use it. Another case is where you have a, what we call a um, complex pack or a multiple, uh, or a pack with multiple breeders. Uh, in Yellowstone, for example, there have been some packs that have had as many as three breeding females. And in that case, you can call the, the top ranking female, who would usually be the mother, uh, you can call that animal the alpha female. But, uh, you know, looked at in, a, in the perspective of uh, wolf packs in general around the world and all, uh, that rarely happens. So um, it's really um, great that we um, stick or update our information as we learn more. And this is Professor David Meech saying um, that he's learned and what he published in his book over uh, 50 years ago is actually inaccurate now. And what we've learned about wolves is they don't have this um, alpha. It's more of a family unit. And so when we live with our dogs, we want to live in a family unit as opposed to I am alpha. And we often see um, on TV or in popular media misinterpretations and people still teaching stuff that people were talking about 50 years ago. If you go to your doctor, you'd hope they're not using information from 50 years ago, but they've updated with the current science and the current information. But why do we struggle um, as general public or as dog trainers to really follow the new information? And one of the things I say to my clients is, when they ask me this question, do I need to be pack leader? Um, I will often use um, the following information. So I will say, first of all, we're not a dog. So even if dogs have um, um, dominance hierarchies between each other, 
Our dogs treat us differently to other dogs. And there's research such as left gaze bias research, which shows that when dogs look at a human face, they look at it slightly differently to how they look at another dog's face or an inanimate object. And so they don't just look at our face like another dog. And so we've got a different relationship. The other bit is, whether we like it or not, we already control most of the things that are most important to, for a dog's life or any life. We control whether they get access to food. We control whether dogs have access to water. We control whether they can reproduce. We control whether they get social attention, whether that's from people or other dogs. We control whether they get access to play and toys. So if we control nearly every aspect of a dog's life, what makes us think that walking through a doorway or um, not letting our dogs on furniture, when dogs don't have, e have any idea what a doorway is, I've never seen a dog live in the wild around doorways, uh, or, how, or get out of bed or on sofas, the alpha dog going, nope, this is my sofa. Um, I've never seen that. So why do we think that walking through a doorway before a dog or um, uh, eating from, I don't see dogs eating from food bowls. So why do we think if I eat from a food bowl before my dog, he's going to learn that I am in charge? We're already in charge. We control every aspect of their life. So rather than trying to be, rather than trying to take more control away from these animals that we live with or we're privileged to live with, especially when these animals don't have a choice to live with us in the first place, I think we should be focusing on how we can give control back to them, not take it away from them. And for me, control is a basic principle of life. Um, why do we behave? We behave so we can control the environment around us. If I'm hot, I can move to a cooler place. If I'm itchy, I can scratch. My behavior allows me to control my world. And so when people say, well, when we're training animals, I'm nice, I give my animals some choice or control, I don't look at it as being nice when I give my dog some control. I just look at it as a basic right of any living creature that behaves. So when we're working with animals, Giving them control is just meeting a basic biological need. And so when you're working with your dogs, give them control. Don't worry, they're not going to take over. Uh, my dogs sleep on my bed. Um, they come on the furniture. I really don't have any problems with any kind of aggressive behavior. And if you do, if your dog says, this, this sofa is way too comfortable, I'm not coming down, then if you don't want them on the furniture, rather than saying, I'm going to stop you coming on the furniture, let's look at giving them more comfortable alternatives. Um, so if I give them a really comfy orthopedic bed on the floor, the dog's like, oh, I love this bed, I'm going to chill out here. And I get fed cheese when I'm on the floor rather than on the sofa. So we can motivate them to do what we want rather than force them. So if we want to train our dogs, let's focus on the science of behavior change rather than dominance. So this is some examples, some wonderful training from London Zoo. So they're working with this copper-banded butterfly fish here. And what you'll see is copper banded butterfly fish eat um, parasites on coral, and they help the coral survive. So they've trained this fish, rather than sticking the net in the water and fishing him out, he'll happily swim into a jug. And so rather than force their behavior on him, they earn his trust and respect. They empower this fish who has emotions and feelings and way more than a five second memory. But what's really neat is if we replay this video, please, just go back and forward is watch, when he goes into the jug, he says, can you let me out, please? And the keeper says, sure. He goes in, he says, can you let me out? And the door opens straight away. Then he goes in and goes, oh, I've still got my keys today, and I'm going to settle down in the middle. And he doesn't ask to be let out. How does he ask to be let out? He uses his behavior. If he wants to come out, he just has to swim to the door, and the door will open. And so even this fish can learn by giving, having choice and uh, have some control. And because a fish has control, the fish can relax. If the fish didn't have any control, so when, once the fish was in the jug, had no way of saying, please let me out, the fish may be more likely to panic. Whereas if the fish says, oh, I can open the door whenever I want, they're going to be more likely to be relaxed and go, yeah, carry on, I'll just eat some shrimp in here, good things happen. And so if we can train fish, then we can train our dogs without chasing them around or sticking choke collars on them or prong collars on them. Because if a fish can do this voluntarily, our dogs can do a lot more for us as well. So um, one of the other things I think our dogs would like us to know 
is just please slow down and listen. Um, listen with our eyes, our ears, our nose. Um, just focus on the dog for a moment because there's so often, when we think of dog training, the number of trainers when I used to do dog training and, um, and I first started, I was so passionate about what I did. I thought, I've got my treat bag, I've got my clicker. Um, and then if I wasn't doing something, click, treat, click, treat, I thought, I'm not doing some training. But actually, the more I learn, the less I realize I know. But also, one of the things I do learn is Actually, a part of training is watching and listening to the learner and listening to what they're doing. And so taking a step back and just saying, before I do stuff, let me just learn about this individual dog. Let me learn more about them. And so when we listen to dogs, we can see certain things. So if we go to the next slide, please. So sometimes our dogs will turn away from us. And so I'm talking to my dog and he goes, oh, one second, I'm just doing it. And I think, he's distracted. But is he really distracted or is he just saying... I need a moment. And our dogs are great at doing that because either they're getting too much information and they just need a break, or it could be that they're saying, actually, hanging around here is a little bit punishing. You keep nagging me or you're making me do things. We say, sit, sit. And what's our obsession with teaching dogs to sit? If you watch wild dogs, they don't just keep sitting. But we want these dogs to just sit, sit. And if I've got bad knees, I've got bad hips, imagine how painful that would be. But we're always like, sit, sit, sit. And so if our dog's are going, this is a bit painful, but they're trying to be nice to us, then sometimes they might just turn away. And we think, now they're just distracted. But often, they're not just distracted. Dogs are very good at trying to reduce conflict. And they'll do that in a passive way. And one way is they'll just turn their body away slightly. And so if your dog does that, think, is my dog just saying to me, calm down, I just need a moment? We often see a lot of times when you see this dog, how much body leaning is going on. This is this dog's way of saying, please move away, stop. <laughs> but actually what happens is I have many dogs every year where I, people phone me up and sadly some of them even get euthanized or get surrendered to humane societies because the dog will bite the child. And then they'll say, he bit without any warning. Um, he lied then, he gave, gave no warning and then suddenly he bit the child's face. And we think, whoa, he's dangerous. But this dog is giving lots of warning. He's moved as far as he can towards an edge. Now there's a wall. And then there's still the threat is approaching him. And so because we don't necessarily read dog as well, we miss all the small signals. So when the dog does bite, we think, oh, wow, it, uh, they gave no warning. But often there's so many warnings. And if you have kids, um, there's really interesting research that came out a number of years ago uh, from the University of Lincoln again, the baby lab. And they found that uh, kids between, I think it was uh, th uh, three or five and seven years old, um, if they saw a dog growling at them and they asked the child, what's the dog saying to you or how do you interpret the dog's behavior? They would say he's smiling. And if they asked the child, what would you do in that situation? The ch some children would say, we'd give the dog a hug. And so what they actually found is when a dog is growling, if you take away the outline of the teeth and you look at the gums, it actually looks like they're smiling. And, but the ch a young child doesn't have the cognitive abilities to be able to tell that there's a threat. So if you have a child and you're not there to supervise and the dog's saying, please move away, the child will misinterpret that signal to think the dog's being friendly. And so it's really important. That's why we say don't leave young children and dogs unsupervised because they don't have the ability to read what the dog is saying. So they use other cues like ear positions. So this dog is turning his ear away. Sometimes we'll be working with a dog and the dog's looking towards us because we've taught the dog watch, watch. But actually the dog's far more focused on what else is going on. And my dog is great at this. He'll turn his ears and his ears will be looking over there. I'll be like, I'm doing this. It's just like when someone's talking to me, I'm looking at them, but actually my focus is completely elsewhere. So when we're talking to our dogs, think, what's the rest of their body doing? When you're talking to someone and their feet are facing this way and they're doing this, it's like they probably want to be exiting this way rather than be talking to you. And so that might say, oh, this person's slightly uncomfortable around me. And so our dogs do that all the time. There's so many other behaviors in this photo. Um, another behavior, we'll come on to some of those behaviors in a second. In this one, we see the tension on the dog's face. The ears are slightly further back. And so when we see that muscle tension, um, that's a dog who's maybe slightly more stressed or unhappy in that situation. We also see the paw lift. Sometimes if dogs are unsure, they'll just lift a paw. And they'll start to move a lot slower. 
Sometimes when I'm working with trainers, um, they'll say to the dog, down, and the dogs will start to, um, like, see, now he's not doing the down, he's being disobedient. And so I'll correct the dog, I'll say, down, even uh, sharper. And then what will happen is the dog will start to move even slower, and they're like, see, now he's just taking the piss. And I was like, he's not. What's happening is he perceives a threat. And so if you perceive a threat and you move fast, you could cause more conflict. Whereas when you start to move slower, then you're actually saying, calm down, I'm not here to cause you a threat. So sometimes when our dogs start to move slow, they're saying, um, do we just need to reduce the um, threat here? I'm just trying to calm things down. So this dog's also doing something called a lip lick. So um, the tongue comes out and does a little flick. And so um, a lip lick could be a sign of a dog saying, um, I'm slightly uncomfortable here, I'd like some distance, I'd like to stop. You might get that with the head turn, the ear facing away, like in this picture. But while I talk about all these different behaviours, I'm not saying any time you see a dog uh, lick their lips, they're stressed, um, because they might lick their lips when they've been eating or drinking. So we have to have all these behaviours in context. Sometimes there's a behaviour called shake-off, where dogs will stand and shake. They can do that when they've had a little stressful interaction, but also they'll do that when they've got out of bed because their fur's um, in the wrong place. So when we watch dogs, we have to look at the whole body and the whole context rather than just seeing one small thing and jumping to conclusions. Um, also, you see soft eyes. Sometimes we see a, a change in blinking. And so these are just some behaviors that you, got, uh, you can pay attention to when you're with your dogs next. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Kendall Shepard, she's a veterinary behaviorist, and in order to help her clients, um, she came up with this um, analogy, this description, and she called it the ladder of aggression. And I really love this because um, it helps uh, my clients understand that their dogs don't just bite for no reason. And so I'm going to share with you, I've added a few annotations to this, and what I say too often with my clients is, these are some of the behaviors that dogs show. Now, Kendall's not saying that every single dog will show all of these behaviors. Some dogs will show behaviors which aren't on this ladder. They won't always show them in this order, but this is a description or a rough um, analogy that makes sense regardless of um, the individual dog. So um, if we hit the next button, please. So uh, some of the behaviors at the bottom of the ladder, I say to my clients, the dog is whispering. As you go up the ladder, it's almost like the person saying, no, really, back away from me now, stop touching me. And if, if, if the person didn't listen, the person might escalate and shout, or they might start screaming. And if that didn't work, they might punch the person. And so the way I think of this is our dogs are escalating their warning signals. They're saying, please stop. Okay, that's not working, I have to raise my voice slightly. Or that's not working, I have to raise my voice slightly. And so when our dogs are doing some of these behaviors, they could be saying, please back away or please stop. Now, if that didn't work, so say the dog growls, and so um, when the dog growls, we often hear, well, he growled, we shouldn't let him get away with that. So sometimes we'll punish them or we'll tell them off. So if we do that, what's happening is we're burning a rung of the ladder. We're saying to the dog, don't warn me. We think of it as we're saying growling is bad, but what the dog learns is growling is dangerous because when I growl, the human gets upset and tells me off. And so what happens is um, we could actually be teaching a dog to become even more dangerous because now the dog will learn that growling is dangerous, so they skip that and they go straight to snapping or biting. And often it's easier to punish some of these other behaviors because we don't notice them. And this also gave me an excuse to use my fire animation, which I couldn't think of any other time to use. So I was like, I will get that into my presentation. Um, but we end up burning this ladder, and when we burn the ladder, it gets shorter and shorter. And then we end up with a dog that we label as less predictable, or a dog who has a shorter fuse. But actually, the dog was giving us all these warning behaviors in the beginning. What's happened is we didn't listen. And then the dogs learn, actually, if I shout and scream, people listen. And we end up with a dog who shouts and screams before they actually even bother with some of these other signals. And so when we end up with um, a ladder which is so burnt, we end up sometimes dogs who just skip most of these steps and will show one or two of these steps and go straight to biting. And if they do that, we really have to start to teach them that there are other ways that you can communicate um, that you want us to back away rather than just go to biting. Thank you. So that's from uh, uh, Kendall's um, book, The Canine Commandments. 
So um, I'm going to show you a video clip. This is a do not try this at home video clip. So when I started training and running puppy classes, I was taught put puppy on their back, uh, wait often until they stop wriggling. The puppy, often hold on the puppy, and when they stop moving and wiggling, and they don't back. Yeah, that's what we have when he has his nails done. Okay. Okay, if we can just pause the video for a second, please. So, um, with that puppy, you saw I picked the puppy up on their back. I was taught you should wait until the puppy starts wriggling because you don't want to teach the dog. When they're wriggling, they get put down. Um, but actually, if we think about this, what are we doing? We're burning that ladder. Can we replay the video, please? So, as I go to pick the puppy up, look, the puppy backs away. And back he go away doesn't work. So, I've burned that rung of the ladder. Next time, I will go to pick the dog up. They go, back in away won't work, I'll go straight to growling. And when the dog tries to move away, the dog's saying, please let me down, but it's not working. Yeah, that's what, what I'm actually doing. Because we can set this up. What, what I'm actually doing there is taking, teaching this dog that when you say, please let me go, no one listens. And then we, it's hard to get rid of biting behavior from animals. It's a behavior that helps them survive. And so soon this dog's going to learn as a human hand goes towards them, I'm just going to lunge forward and bite. And so what we think of as I'm teaching him restraint, we're actually probably teaching the dog that you don't have a voice. So if we see a dog who's saying, I'm uncomfortable, can you move away? The first thing we want to do is say, sure. And then we rather than go, I'm going to come and grab you. If I'm working with an elephant, I can't just go and grab them. And so we can motivate them to come and give us their feet. Or we can motivate them to give us the ear. And so what we want to do is we want to motivate the puppy to want to come and lie on their back voluntarily. And so if we slow down, we build trust, like you saw in the video clip with that fish, then soon that dog will want to be there and want to be touched. But rather than force ourselves to do that, we want the dog to really build that trust and confidence and offer that behavior. One of the other things I think it's really important for our dogs to be able to have is a safe place. If you go home and your house is a safe place for you, it's a place where you can relax. You can take a deep breath. You can have a cup of tea or coffee. Um, you can go to sleep. But then suddenly, random people just start walking into your house, and you have no control when they're going to turn up. You can't ask them to leave when you want them to leave. They just come in your house. They sit on your furniture. They pick up your remote controller, your favorite books. They come and sit on your bed, and they try all your toys. They pick up your toys. Um, they try even talking to you when you want to ignore them. How would that make you feel? probably quite anxious. How many times for our dogs is they learn, okay, I'm in this house, it's my safe place, and then suddenly strangers walk in, and they can't ask the strangers to leave, and then the strangers walk around, they can't predict their movements. And so sometimes if our dogs can't have a safe place, we need to be able to give them other safe places. And we can do that by saying, I'm gonna give you a little mat or a crate, and I'm gonna make that the best place in the world. So if you gave me ice cream on a certain sofa or somewhere, I'd be like, I'm your best friend. So what we can do is we can say, for the dog's ice cream, that might be hot dogs, cheese, chicken. It could be sitting down, talking to them, giving them strokes if that's what they like. And so I would give my dog the mat or their bed, and I would sit down, give, feed them lots of nice things on there. And so the dog goes, I love being in this place. Lots of good things happen. I feel safe. Then what I would do is I'd have that area so the dog can always access it. But if someone came to my house or if I have children at the house, I would ask the children and the strangers never to go near the dog's bed. So if the dog does want to retreat, they've got a place they can say, I'm just going to take myself to my bedroom for a second, and no one's going to approach. And suddenly a dog who's feeling unsafe because people are all over the place has some kind of control in the environment, and they can start to relax. I take my dog to seminars and workshops, and often if I do, I say to people, if he comes up to you, you can interact with him. But if he comes and lies on his bed, please just ignore him. Because that's his way of saying, I'm done, this is my little break time, and so that's his comfort couch. So make sure your dogs have a safe place when you go home. And um, if you do have young people living with you, then there's actually research that shows that young people are more receptive to what you do rather than what you say. So I'm going to give you some children training tips free. Um, I won't charge any extra. But they actually have learned that with children, if you say, don't go near the dog's bowl when they're eating, 
but they watch you go near the dog's bowl when they're eating. They'll do what they watch, not what you heard. Because um, watching you is way more um, receptive information for them, important information, than just what they hear. So if you do have children at home, if you go up to a dog when they're sleeping, or you start cuddling them and putting your face near the dog's face, when you're not there, the child might do the same thing. So it's really important that we model safe and responsible behavior around children because you can tell them as much as you want, don't do that. But the child doesn't have the cognitive abilities to be able to process and do that information. So they're not just being naughty children, they're just learning the way children do. So we have to be more responsible adults. So um, when we talk about training, I think our dogs want us to learn one big message here. When we think of training, we sometimes think of training as I'm going to teach the dog obedience or I'm going to do agility. But actually training is way more powerful than that. I'm going to share with you a quote from a trainer called Ken Ramirez. And I love his definition of training. Okay. And so uh, my, re -big th uh, my big rethink of training is the following quote. And so, um, just as one would never consider developing an animal care program without a veterinary component, a nutritional component, a social component, and an environmental component, nobody should consider caring for an animal without a behavior management component um, in integrated into a program. So when we're caring for our pet dog, or our pet goldfish, or our pet rabbit, we feed them, we give them attention, but they also need behavior management because every animal that we work with and live with behaves. And so for me, training is behavior management. When we teach a dog to sit or give us their paw, that's the same training that we use to teach the dog to feel comfortable having their feet wiped or putting their lead and collar on. So anything we want the dog to do day-to-day -day life, living with humans, we should use training for, not just things that benefit us. Too often we use training for making our lives easier. But first and foremost, we should use the same science and the same technology to benefit the individual animals. So things that are going to help the animals live happier and stressful, less stressful lives in the human society we're asking them to live in. And so this is a fantastic example, a lampshade. Um, lots of dogs have to wear them when they're sick or they've had an operation. This was a trainer, so tra uh, was, he still is, a trainer in Nice, uh, Benjamin, and he sent me this video clip, and so his dog was backing away and moving away from the lampshade. So we discussed what he should do with the, uh, from a training point of view. So he went and did it and sent me this next video clip. And what I love here <laughs> is yeah. who puts the lampshade on? <laughs> the dog. Benjamin's just like, the dog's like, you're my butler. You will hold the lamp stage, you will hold the lampshade still. And the dog's like, I can do this myself. And so if that wasn't clear, and look how much time he spends making it worthwhile for the dog to do it again. He rewards and reinforces that behavior. So the next time the dog sees a lampshade, he's like, I want to stick my head straight in there. And so... When you go home and you think of training, remember, our dogs have feet, they have, they're able to do things for themselves. So rather than thinking of training as something that we do to animals, okay, um, I want you to think of training as not something that we do to an animal, but we, something we do with them. Training is a conversation. So for me, when I'm working with animals, I think of training as a conversation. I say something, then the dog says something and I change what I'm doing based on what the dog is saying back to me. Rather than I say you do, it's a conversation between two individuals. So when you go home, rather than thinking, I'm telling you what to do, dog, remember, the dog didn't say I want to come and live with you. We made that choice for them. So let's give them a voice and listen to them too. When you think about training, the way I think of training is there's two things. You can either teach animals to do things, because if they don't do them, there's going to be a, a consequence they want to escape. So you're going to shout at them, or you're going to nag them, or you're going to tell them off. Or I can ask my dogs to do things and make it worthwhile for them. So if they do things, they get a paycheck. How many of us would go work if we never got a paycheck? If the paycheck stopped, we'd probably stop going to work. Why do we expect our dogs to work without paychecks? And so paychecks could equal many different things for dogs. They could be food. 
They could be objects. I remember a dog who wouldn't eat food outside, but we were teaching recall, and I went for a walk, and the client says, he doesn't eat food. And I said, okay, let's just go for a walk and see what he does. As we're walking along, the dog pulls her and grabs hold of a water bottle on the floor and then starts to shake his head and um, bite the bottle. And then the water that's in the bottle leaks out. He drops the bottle and walks off. And she goes, oh, yeah, he loves bottles. Anytime he sees a bottle, as long as it's got something in there, he'll want to kill it, and the water leaks, and then he'll lose interest. And then what we did was rather than use food because he didn't want food outside, we just took little water bottles with us. And any time we called him, we'd bring the water bottle out and he would grab the bottle, he would shake it. That was so much fun for him. That was his paycheck. So when we called him, he'd be like, I'm running to my person because I get a water bottle. And that was fun for him. So with our dogs, we can use anything. A paycheck could be anything they find reinforcing enough to do that behavior again. It could be interaction with other people, animals. If my dog does something with me, I can say, okay, you can go meet Mr. Fox, your cat friend. And he, so he gets to meet his cat friend, he will do things for me because he likes meeting the cat. Um, it may be movement. If he likes running, I can say, could you do a hand touch? Could you give me a paw? Okay, now let's run together. And so if our dogs like running, we can use that as a reinforcer. Sounds, when I'm training my parrots or working my parrots, if I ask my parrot to give me a foot or open her mouth or give me a wing, I can actually play a YouTube video or music on YouTube and let her listen to that for a little while. And then when I put the music away, she'll go, no, no, here's my wing, you can play the music again. <laughs> when we're working with primates or great apes, we're teaching them to brush their teeth or give voluntary blood samples. They'll actually do those behaviors because they get to watch a little bit of YouTube. And then you put the phone away and they're like, no, no, carry on, here's my arm, can I watch YouTube again? So we can even use anything that they find reinforcing. Could be a paycheck different smells. If we're working with animals in heat and we've got a male animal and there's a female on heat next door, we could take some of her urine and he will actually work for smelling of the urine. And so anything could be a reinforcer um, that will make it worthwhile for them to do those behaviors again. Um, sometimes we think about, well, if I don't want the animal to do a behavior, I'll punish it. And often our interpretation of punishment is actually in inaccurate uh, uh, if we compare it to what science says uh, about punishment. But also what we know about punishment, although it works, there are many side effects. And a lot of those side effects actually cause negative welfare states for animals too. And they can cause animals to show more aggressive behaviors. And so I personally like to focus on making it worthwhile for my animals to do the behaviors I want rather than focus on trying to stop the behaviors I don't want using punishment. And if, I, if you want to learn more about punishment, you can go on my Facebook page, and I did a live feed um, a, a few months ago where I talk about punishment for about an hour and a half. So if you want to hear more of my voice, which I'm sure everyone here does, go on to Facebook and you can listen to me talk about punishment. If you don't have Facebook, you can go on YouTube and you can hear the same thing. So my last one, I think it's my last one, is our dogs... I think are saying to us, it's okay to spoil me. When, people, when I go to people's homes and they say, I, I know, I'm sorry. It's like, why are you apologizing? And they're like, I'm Canadian. It's like, no, that's fine. <laughs> like, so it's like, why are you apologizing? And they say to me, I know, I spoil my dog and I shouldn't spoil my dog. And the first thing I say is, well done. I, lo I love you already. I love the fact that you spoil your dog. Because why do we live with dogs if we're not going to spoil them? Yeah. I don't live with my dog so I can make his life harder. I live with my dog because I want to give him a happy life. So this is some of my dog's toys. If I go shopping for him, he can have whatever he wants. Does that make him more aggressive? No. Does that make him more stubborn? No. Gives him a happy life. He gets to choose which toy he wants to play with. He has a whole toy box. But when we give them happy lives and we fulfill their need for enrichment, for exercise, for mental stimulation, for care, then we have dogs who don't show problem behaviors. And so I'm going to tell you it's okay to spoil your dogs. The only thing I say is make sure that you're not giving conflicting information. So my dogs are loud on the furniture. If you don't want your dogs on furniture, or if you get a puppy and you go, when the dog is 70 kilos, I don't want them jumping on the furniture, then don't spoil them when they're young by allowing them on the furniture. Then change the rules on them overnight, because that's not fair. But if you don't have any issues with your dogs on furniture, let them go on your furniture. If you enjoy sleeping with your dog or watching a movie, you can do Netflix and chill with your dog. And so there's really nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your dogs, and your dogs will enjoy that and give so much trust and relationship back. 
And so thank you for listening. If you have any questions, we're happy to talk to you guys, uh, answer the questions at the end. And just enjoy the journey. Um, too often we're focused on getting to the end point with our dog. I'm going on a walk, I need to get to the park. And you lose all that time to get to a park. And so when we're living with our dogs, don't focus on trying to get to an end point, just enjoy the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Bao. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, or if you're excited about getting home and working with your dog or your cat. I do. I'm inspired. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think it's time for us to maybe take a five-minute break, bathroom break. There's still drinks available in the bar, or in the lobby, sorry, in the lobby. And our merchandise table is open, and there's a, we're going to have a draw for a gift basket. So don't forget to put your name in, and then we'll draw that when we come back. So let's take a five-minute break, Amy, and stretch. And the washrooms are this way, out by the lobby. So we're going to invite up our uh, canine friends now, so we're going to hold off on the clapping. Our first friend we're going to meet is uh, a Border Collie mix named Clover, and Clover is nervous of skateboards, harnesses, and people approaching her, and nail trims. So you've got a lot of work to do, Shrag. I'm hoping you're going to do that. And I'll, I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you. So Amy has uh, Clover with her, and we're going to have no expectations. We're just going to see what happens. We're going to live in the now. And so we've made some environmental arrangements. We've put Clover's water bowl um, out, so she wants to come and have water. Um, she has her own bowl. And for me, that's just like having my own mug. So if I go home and I lift my mug up, it feels differently to picking up a paper glass or a paper cup. And so for dogs, if we stick a bowl down, which they don't know about, they might go up to it and go, this smells of other dogs, and it makes them uncomfortable. If they don't like different people and it smells of different people, they're less likely to drink. So we make sure she's got her own water. We could even bring the water from home. So she goes, this coffee tastes like my coffee at home. And we've got her own bed. So this is just like her own armchair. When she sits on it, she goes, this smells like my own armchair. It feels like my own armchair. This is good. And so that will help her relax. We've put some treats on there, so when she turns up, there's a positive surprise. She goes, oh, nice things happen here. We've got familiar objects that smell of her and things she knows, so we're just going to chuck one over there. So when she walks in, uh, she goes, how did this get here? This is mine. Or she might just ignore it. We're going to chuck another one somewhere else so that when she walks in, she goes, oh, there's my picture frame. I have that at home. Oh, it is my one. And then there's a few things that she likes doing. Um, and so some of her favorite activities are here, her yoga mat. I'm not joking. Um, and then we have her fit paw, uh, bony thing. So we're going to stick that there. And then we're going to ask Amy if you'd like to go um, get Clover for us. Now, Amy really doesn't know also what we're actually going to do. So I'm going to talk Amy through this as Clover comes in. Um, Clover... Um, May you want people to stay further away from her. Nice. You're just going to stand there, Amy, for a second. Just let her sniff. Good. Stand still. Nice. And then you're just going to let her sniff, look around. Good. Nice job keeping that leash relaxed. The leash is smiling. And we always want the leash to smile, which is perfect. And then we're just going to let Clover eat the treats. She's going to look around. She's going to read the stories. She's like, oh, my mug. Oh, I'll have some of this coffee. And then we're just going to walk over, let her do whatever she wants. And um, if she looks at you, say, good girl, drop some treats on her bed. Nice. And then drop a few more. Nice. Kneel down, pick them up, and drop a few more on there. Good. There we go. And she comes over, just stand up again. Excellent. We're just going to say to her, when you come out and there's scary things, rather than take yourself into too much trouble, and you might go too close to people, then go, oh my God, I'm too close. We're going to say, just check them out at a distance, and then go back to your safe place. Notice how she's walking slowly. She's looking from a distance. She's learning about me rather than coming up close and going, oh my God, I don't like men. I'm too close. I need to bark at him. We're just going to say, you can check men out at a distance. And when you do that, you get treats. And she goes, oh my God, I love looking at men at a distance. I get treats. <laughs> okay. Good. So you're just going to let her um, look around and you can stop feeding her for a second. The only time you're going to feed her now is she goes back to her mat and you're going to do what you're doing. Nice leash, relax. Nice leash, relax. Nice, relax leash. 
and we're going to let her check things out, look at her nose, look at her ears. She's like, oh, I know that person. And we're just going to walk up slowly. She's going to say hello to Kim, who she knows. And Kim's just going to let her check her out. And then once she's done, you guys are just going to ignore her. Otherwise, she she goes, I know that person too. I live with him. It's like Dr. Karen. She's a good person. She knows behavior. And then you're just going to stand there and wait for a second. If she heads back, we're going to make the bed a nice place for her to be. And we're going to just let her relax for a moment. Remember those stories. I don't want to just put a paper in front of her and keep turning the pages. Too often we bring a dog in and start going, okay, now you have to sit. Now you have to do this. But I don't even know her. And so if someone just met me and said, do this, do this, do this, I don't know you. Um, and so why should I tell her what to do if I've just met her? And she's still really busy. She's paying attention to the world around her, checking things out. But this is great. If you normally say that she can be slightly underconfident in new situations, she's learning to relax. She's learning to take things in. It's great. Look at her. She's still she's going, oh, there's people up there. Oh, nice. And we're going to say, well done for checking out people. And you get good things happen again. And then she's now she's able to then process people again, but do it in a relaxed way. You're doing a great job of staying nice and calm, Amy, just letting her watch. That was fantastic. Did you see what she did? She went forward one or two steps, and she goes, this is my distance. I don't need to go closer. I'm just going to look. But so many of our dogs, we don't teach them to slow down. So what they do is they go running up to people and go, oh, my God, I'm too close. And then they freak out. Nice. She looked at me a couple of times. That's great. So she's like, I'm checking you out. And when dogs check people out, they don't just go up to people and go, Because that can be quite confronting. For dogs, if two dogs go up to each other and stick their uh, mouth next to each other, you've got two sets of teeth. And that's going to cause a fight. That's why dogs do nose to butt. And so for her, it's absolutely normal keeping her head down and just sneaking a little peek in. So we want to encourage that. That's how dogs always check things out. They don't just look at stings and stare at them. And I'm looking for his muscle relaxation. I'm looking for her to walk in a way that um, is comfortable movement, relaxed gait, to be able to use her nose and sniff. If dogs are uncomfortable, often they'll look, but they're more really sharp um, rather than having a smooth body. And she's moving, her muscles are relaxed, her head's lower. They're all good positive signs. And when I think of a training session, my goal for a training session is always to think, will the dog want to come back next time? So if I go up to my dog and say, should we play? I want my dog to go, definitely I want to come back because they had such a great time last time. Nice, she's checking people out again and then she goes back to good things happen on your mat. And this is great um, desensitization and counter conditioning, meaning she's breaking, rather than just dealing with a person right in front of her, she sees people at a distance and then people can come closer and closer. But she also learns to relax in between. And then also, and what's happening is she's also seeing people and going, oh, when I see people, I get treats, I get feel really good. And we're changing how she feels around people too. She looks at me, she checks me out, she checks you out pays a bit of attention, reads all the stories. When she checks her bed out, we go, good, there's another treat. Now, if I was to just give her treats from my hand, I might put her into conflict because she's going to go, scary stranger has food, so she's going to approach, but she doesn't actually want to be close to me. And then sometimes what will happen with dogs is they'll actually come close, they'll eat the treat, but they'll bite the hand. Or they'll eat the treat, then they'll bark or growl. Because what we've done is we've actually brought the dog in too close to us because they want the food, but they don't want to be close to us. So what I teach the dog to do is, um, be look at her, she's standing on the bed, and look how long she's spending reading all the stories and looking at you. She's learning, and as soon as she's done, and she goes, okay, take a breath, then good things happen on a mat. So I want her to sit in an armchair and just look at the scary things and learn that good things happen. And then when she's more comfortable, then I want her to approach. So when she approaches me, she never feels like, I'm too close, I need to bite this person. I'm not saying she would bite, but we, if any animal scared, they could bite. So she's looking at me. That's fine. Goes back to, ah, oh, okay, I can just go back down to sniffing. 
lifts her head up, looks around a little bit more. You see her ear going back. Remember I told you they use their ears? So she's using her ear to check you guys out, but also pay attention towards me. And we're going to give her a moment. She's busy. She's on Facebook. <laughs> she's like, okay, I'm ready now. So when she's ready, you can see if she wants to come make it closer to me. So maybe just take one or two steps in my direction, see what she does. Just stop and see if she walks with you. If she doesn't, she might be saying, no, I don't want to go near him. She's like, okay. Let me take one more step. Just wait, see what she offers you. She's going to look at things, think about life. It's like I'm going to look at him. I'm going to look over there, turn my head, look over there. Okay, I might go forward. She comes forward, she sniffs things, she checks out her uh, bone, her yoga mat, checks out a new surface, you can go with her. When she's done, she might go back to her mat, and then you can give her a treat. And for most people, this would look like so boring. Um, excellent dog training, in my opinion, is boring. When you see the sexy stuff, watching them do backflips, often um, the dogs aren't actually enjoying that. And so um, when we slow things down, we calm it down for the dogs benefiting so much. So she's watching me, she's taking information, remaining calm. You're asking her, do you want to come forward? She said, no, thank you. So I would just take a step back. As if she wanted to come forward, she would have walked. She's like, no, I'm avoiding that man. Today, I'm just going to watch him from a distance. But maybe tomorrow, I'll go close to him. She can go and say hello to dad. Now that's another thing is when dogs, uh, when I'm working with a human and their dog, I never ask them to ignore their dog. Even if I want to give their dogs treats and do stuff, as if I say just ignore your dog, it's like to say to you, ignore your child as I'm talking to them. Then the child goes, mum, is it okay? And I say, no, no, ignore your child. We take away that child's safety. So human that they live with is part of the dog's safety. If we don't let the dog approach when they want to, or we just say, I'm ignoring you now, you have to deal with this scary stranger. That can be really intimidating. So she, we never take away her safety. We invite her and she goes, okay, this time I'm okay to come check out this guy. He's not so bad. And we're going to let her just sniff. Notice how when she walks by, she walked uh, to the side of me and went behind me. Because if she approaches me face on, that's quite intimidating. She's still, you can carry on walking with her. She's checking things out. Notice how she curves around me. Now, when she's done, we're going to go back to her bed and you're going to go with her and drop a treat for her, tell her, well done for checking out that brave man, that scary man. <laughs> well done for being brave. <laughs> but I'm not going to put her into conflict by saying, go close to the stranger because you get food. I want her to go, actually, I'm relaxed enough to go check him out. And when she came, she learned that nothing bad happened, and actually she got to go back to safety, and we added treats, and good things happened there. She wants to come back, she can. She might do other things, you might like, <laughs> okay. And I really like how Amy's asking her, so rather than just walking off, Amy's taking a step, and if she says no, Amy goes, okay, that's fine, we'll stand out here for a second. And if she looks at Amy, Amy can say, should we go a different direction? You can try going back to the mat or go somewhere else. Like, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> so, Let's try, um, now she's slightly more relaxed around you. You said um, she doesn't necessarily like having her feet touched or exa examined, is that correct? Okay, so uh, <laughs> he's like, hello, don't forget me. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> we're here to serve. Um, and so um, they have a voice, we listen. Um, and so <laughs> it's like, thank you. And so one of the things uh, we're going to do is we can practice doing some poor behaviors if you like. So one of the games we can play with poor behaviors is seeing if she'll put a pause onto things. So what I'd like you to do is see if she'll put her feet onto the pink cushion for us. And there's different ways we can do that. We can use a treat or we can see if she'll walk up to them. And if she does, say, good girl, and give her a treat. Now, if we give her a paycheck, she's more likely to do this in the future. Nice. And you can give her another paycheck whilst keeping her feet there. Excellent. Then you're going to drop a treat off so she moves off the pod. Excellent. Now you're going to kneel down next to the pod. Excellent. And if she puts her feet back on, you're going to say, well done, and give her a treat. Nice. And just wait and see what she offers you. Let's see if she puts her feet back on the pod. 
It's like, um. <laughs> you might want to take a little step back away from the pod, see if that gives her a bit more space or opens up that space and see if she comes forward. <laughs> no. <laughs> It's like, no, that's fine. So we can use, um, they're like, you're laughing at me. Don't do that, it's rude. Um, and so you can use a treat and see if she follows the treat forward. Nice, and then give her a little treat, excellent. And then we'll um, take a treat and we'll drop it away from the pod so she has the opportunity to get off. Excellent. Do you need more food? There we go. Our dogs need to eat. So when people say, well, I don't want to use food, well, you have to feed them. You might as well use their food while you're training. Nice. Excellent. She's like, I can do my back feet too. I can even do a sit for you. Okay. And then this time what I'd like you to do is kneel down next to the pod and just keep your half, um, palm of your hand on the pod and then see if she'll encourage her to, they're good, give her a treat, excellent. And then um, put your palm back on the pod, see what she does. Good, and give her a treat. Nice. And then wait till she finishes. Just wait for a second. There we go, give her a treat. And when she does that, I'm gonna ask you just to keep your hand flat, so we're not gonna try and touch her foot, we're just gonna let her feel comfortable and take it off. And then when you're ready, we'll ask her, good. Now when we hold our hand out, we're just asking. We're not telling the dog you have to do anything. If the dog says no, we say that's okay. If she's busy, just wait. She's looking around. She says, okay, I'm done. <laughs> Time for something else, that's fine. We'll move on to the next exercise. She's done with that for a moment. We'll go to something else. And you mentioned she can be sensitive around harnesses. Um, so again, that might be me thinking, I've just met this dog, my client's saying to me, doesn't like foot being touched, doesn't like harnesses. Now that could be for different reasons. Could it be that when we used the harness, she had a bad experience? And we got a bit of a fur caught in the harness. Could it be that the harness was uncomfortable? When she put it on, it rubbed underneath her. Um, there's so many of these harnesses out that when you actually watch how the dogs are wearing them, they're right underneath the armpits. And it must be so uncomfortable. When you actually take the harness off, the dogs move more normally. So when you use a harness, use one that doesn't interfere with their gait. But it could also be that maybe she has some kind of pain. I don't know, I'm just not saying she's got pain, but I'm saying it's a possibility. So if I've got a dog who doesn't like being touched, doesn't like the harness coming on, I might say, do they have a muscle ache? Do they have a back problem? Do they have leg problems? If they don't have any of those, it's just maybe they've learned um, that I'm, I don't know what that piece of equipment is. So we ask all of these different questions. Excellent. So um, I think that was a nice little session for her. And if she's taking a break and going, it's time for uh, TV time or going to bed time, let's finish here. Because next time she comes back, I want her to go, I want to do that again, rather than going, it's always so boring, it goes on so long, I don't want to come back. So she's had a good time. She's, I think, got lots of treats. She's come and investigated a man, which she's normally scared of. And so I would say, let's end it on a good note. Nice. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna go check out dad again. <laughs> Excellent, perfect. And then we can just walk out with her. As you walk out, you can walk out slowly and just let her lead. She goes, okay, I'm done, see? <laughs> she was like, yeah, have done. So when we listen to dogs, she did a few bits of exercise, but she's like, okay, I'm done now. And let's just stop. I know when I'm listening to a lecture, for the first 20 minutes, I might be paying attention. But then after 20 minutes, I need time to just let my brain process it and calm down. So I might get my phone out and go on Facebook. Then 15 minutes later, I go, okay, now I can focus again. But if I couldn't, if someone said, put your phone away, just because I'm looking doesn't mean I'm learning. So if we just say to our dogs, no, look at me, and it doesn't mean our dog's learning anything. Maybe they're just doing it because they have to. So when we work with our dogs, work with them rather than just telling them what to do. Do we have time for our next dog? Okay, so can we get his bowl and his mat and his stuff again before we bring him in, please? Excellent, thank you. Uh, so this, is, this is Ben. This is ben. He's nervous, uh, uh, 
who's nervous of tall men, I will start to... I'll walk like this. Skateboards. Skateboards. And people running by. Oh, and people <laughs> running by him. Please stay in your seats. I like when we lay out beds uh, for animals. We normally go, oh, we just make sure they're really neat and tidy. When my dog gets on there, he's just like, eh. And he goes like that. It makes me feel better making it all nice and neat. There we go. Thank you. Okay, the tall man's going to move away. <laughs> okay. So I haven't met these dogs yet, so... They're just, just as new to me as they are to you. Okay, so you're going to just walk nice and slowly. Perfect. And we're just going to stand still for a moment. Just let him take in the stories. Good. Just walk over with him and you're just going to follow him. And you're going to take his cues from him. Excellent. Good. Did you see there when that little noise happened, he kind of spooked a little bit? So he's slightly aroused and um, ready for action, doesn't the fight flight? Um, um, so we're just going to help him calm down. He's got a little bit of pilo erection on the back. His uh, fur's sticking up. That might be normal for him. That might not be. We don't know uh, because I only just met him. So I can ask his caregiver, is that normal for him, the fur sticking up? Okay, so this is just telling us this is a bit too much. So let's just slow down, stand still. Perfect. We're going to stop there. Good. You're going to let him look. Nice. Now take some treats and pop them on his mat. Because if we just ignore him, he goes, okay, this is getting too much. He might start barking. Um, so what we're going to do is help him go to a relaxed place. Once he, ta once he looks around at the scary things, we're going to go back to a relaxed place. Nice. Good. And then you're going to just stop for a second. And we're going to let him look around. Where's my treats? He looks around, that's all good. And we're going to let him be for a second. He's just enjoying the moment. He's busy doing something. His tail's really high up. Is that normal position for his tail? Okay. So again, each dog is an individual. We have to know about each individual dog. So it's not just, oh, I know about dogs, but I don't know anything about this individual. So by asking questions back to his caregiver, I can learn what's normal for this individual. It's like people, we have our own personalities, our characteristics. Our dogs have their own characteristics, learning histories. Nice. Sniffing is a normal dog behavior. Remember from the video how powerful their nose is. So he's just learning about the world using his nose. If you went somewhere that might be slightly scary and they just kept paying you $50 bills, you'd want to go back the next time. That's all we're doing here. So when people say, you're just feeding the dog, but the next time the dog wants to come back, so it worked. Good, he's looking around, he's taking information, you're standing nice and calmly letting him do that. He's learning about the world around him, you're just going to watch his body language. And then if he looks like he's getting upset, you would just help him go back to his bed. But if he's happy just checking things out, you're going to let him do that. He goes back to sniffing for treats. So he goes, people, muscle tension, oh, relax treats. People, muscle tension, relax. And then he's going to go, people, relax. And then treats. So we change his emotional state. We change how he's feeling. We change his behavior. Takes a check out people, that's all nice. We nearly saw a little butt movement there. And he goes back to his mat and searches for treats. And what's interesting is notice how much time he spends um, on the nose to the floor. And that we think, well, he's just looking for treats, but is he using Facebook? Is he saying, there's so many people in the room, if I just stick my head on my phone, I can avoid them. And he could be using his behavior as going, I'm just avoiding people, not just looking for treats. 
And so we may think he's looking for treats, but occasionally he sneaks in that little look and then goes, I come back on Facebook. So don't just think because his head's down that he's not knowing you're there. He's actually using his behavior to help him relax and learn about the environment. See, even with his nose down, he's walking this way. Rather than looking up at me walking, he's checking out the world but keeping his nose down. Dogs do this all the time. When we're working with the wolves, I was just with them, the puppies, now they're growing up a year later. And when they come up to new people, well, you'll see their head down sometimes and we're looking at the corner and approaching. Um, but that's how do dogs and animals, uh, uh, canines do things. Notice when he's coming forward how he keeps his feet back and then when he has to, he stretches forward. If he was relaxed, he would just walk into that space. So we know that he's not 100% relaxed in this situation. See, he's using, look how his nose is twitching. It's going to one, um, like so fast. When dogs' noses are twitching really fast, they're taking in lots of information. I would just stop there. You're going to be his teacher and say, if we go too close, it might be scary. So I want you to just do it from a distance and the next time go a bit closer. So you're just going to stand still, let him look. And then you're going to look at his nose, how fast it's going. And we're just going to let him look. And if you think he's relaxed, you can let him come closer. If you think he's not relaxed, then you're going to say, let's go back that way. If you think he's okay, if you think he's okay? Okay, so his tail's gone down. So um, that's a really good, like you're reading his body language well. So you're gonna, just going to stop there. You're not going to let the leash come forward. You're just going to be a tree. And you're just going to let him look. Nice, and then pop a treat on his mat. Teach him that when you're unsure and your tail goes down, rather than going into a scary place, move away from the scary place. And you did that perfectly. You used the treats and guided him back. <laughs> like, don't laugh at me. Okay. Yeah, nice. You can give him another treat. Remember, we're here to make their lives happy. Don't be stingy. Nice, when you're done, you can see if he wants to walk further again, you just walk with him. And I loved how you picked up on his tail changes. It just shows when we really are receptive to watching our dogs and listening to them, we see those small changes in their behavior. Good. And notice he's keeping back, so I would just shift your um, feet so you're further behind him, because otherwise he's just following you into a situation. We want him to lead you into a situation. Because if there's a scary things, rather than a dog following us into a scary things, let the dog decide when they're ready to approach. Also, when I'm watching, I'm just watching his movement, his gait, watching how he walks. Do I see any abnormalities? Do I see any weird gaits, like as in abnormal gaits? Do I see them lifting their leg up or walking uncomfortably? Could there be other factors? So it gives us a chance to watch the whole dog and think, how do they move? What does the rest of their body do? Could there be other things going on? And his, his tail stayed up, he's coming closer, which is excellent. See, he does the whole nose on the floor, pretend I'm licking treats, like I'm taking information while I'm on Facebook. Keep your head sideways, check that guy out for the side so you're not being confrontational. And I'm just looking, checking him out. Rather than staring at him, I'm just going to look away. And then we're just gonna, you're going to keep an eye on him. He's checking things out. You've got the lick lipping going on. Um, again, that could be stress, but it could also be just processing the world around us. And then what you're going to do is once he goes, you've got a treat bag on person. You must be giving, have stuff for me. <laughs> and he's, uh, once he's done, um, and he looks at you, then you can say to him, why don't we go back to our bed? <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> and they just toss a treat on the bed. Perfect. It's like, remember, Chirag said, don't be stingy. <laughs> Look at this. Now he's taking a direct path towards me rather than doing the whole banana. And his tail staying up. He's like, Mom, I'm doing this. Look at how he's, he's taking information. He stops himself. It's so beautiful how you're standing behind him and letting him make those choices. He's going to look up. He's going to take some smells. And then you're going to teach him that, well done. Now say, let's go back to our bed. Good. Now he's not approaching me just because I'm giving him treats. 
but he's approaching me because he can take information. So I'm not putting him into that conflict. For me, dog training isn't about that end um, destination. I need to get him to like men. It's that journey is so important. So we focus on the journey, not just the destination. Now he goes, oh, there's people out there. I'm going to take information. And notice how he's doing it each time. He's coming closer to you. It's like, um, that's okay, mom, I'm done. You can say, well, that's okay, we'll go back to your bed. If the dog says, I'm done, we don't have to go walk, and some dogs will do that by stopping and looking at you. Other dogs will just plant their feet. And if you keep walking, then they'll be like, oh, I have to go forward because mom's going. But if you watch them and you listen and you go, the dog just said I've had enough, and you go back, the dog goes, oh, that worked. The lower ends of the ladder work. If I just stop and say, no, thank you, I don't have to escalate up. If you didn't like a spider, sometimes you might go, you go oh, no, I'll stop here and look at the spider. Other times you might go, okay, I'm feeling a bit more confident now, and I'll go forward. Nope, this time I'm going to go back. That's all he's doing. <sighs> nice. He hears the mic, the noises. That's all weird for him, the smells. I would say, good boy. It's fine. You can keep doing that. I'm sure he won't mind. You can ask him a question. You can walk a different direction and see if he wants to walk with you. I said, oh, okay then, you can do that. Notice the nose is going, he's busy, he's sniffing. He's taking information, just let him do that. Let him read the story. Look at that nose going. I love his ears. He's taking information, checking things out. His tail's gone slight down, come back up. Excellent, you can go with him. Now he's braver to walk further. But that braveness didn't come from inside of him. Why is he getting braver? Because of all the reinforcement he's getting. When you said you're scared of skateboards and he just walks over to one. It's like, you lied. <laughs> but um, he didn't say you lied. Uh, I'm reading his mind, I'm not. Um, he just, but when animals are relaxed, suddenly they approach things that they wouldn't normally approach. Because what we do is we often, if we have to bring him in, he's already stressed, then we start doing all the scary stuff and he becomes more and more stressed. What we've done is allowed him to come in, relax, and then we're starting to... So when dogs relax, suddenly they're more braver and also the fact he's able to come forward, get all this reinforcement and retreat, and he has control over his environment, he's feeling more and more confident. If you go to a dentist and um, the dentist, you don't have any control over the dentist, um, then you're going to feel more anxious. If you go to a dentist and you can say, the dentist goes, if you want me to stop at any point, just make a fist. And you make a fist and the dentist stops. Suddenly you relax. All we're doing is saying to him, you can make a fist when you want us to stop. And so we're giving him control and choice. Like, can you feed me, please? It's like, sure, I can feed you. Here we go. But look at his gait, it's changed, it's much more relaxed. You've got more wobble in his back end um, and more muscle relaxation, so we've got a more relaxed learner. So now we can expose him to skateboards or we can expose him to things, but he's learning from a point of relaxation, not a point of stress. But he's still busy, so we're going to let him check these things out. If this dog was just standing there going, nah, this is boring, that's boring, I might start moving the skateboard. But at the moment, there's so many priorities for him, for him to check things out. So that's what we're going to let him do. And he's like, I don't need to go back to my bed. I can do this out here. That's great. Because we can't always carry a bed with us down the street. So we start fading the bed. And we don't need the bed all the time. But we start with the bed as a safe place. And then we can ask, go forward. <laughs> it's like, I'm asking for a treat, please. Thank you. But this is a conversation. This is what training is about. Why is it wrong for him to ask for a tree? He... <laughs> nice. He's standing around me, his tail's up. He's not that bothered. He's not um, hypervigilant. That's excellent. He's really learning to relax in this situation. So I'm going to move. The scary man is moving. 
and he checks me out when I'm moving. That's all fine. Wait for him to take this information. He's like, okay, I'm done, mum, and give him a treat. Say, well done for being nice and calm and scary man moving as good things happen. I might move the skateboard just for a second. He's, he can watch if he wants. And so I'm going to move the skateboard slightly. Normally, you said he spooks out. So we're going to move this. We're going to let him process. He's looking. Yeah, done. I'll put a treat on his bed. Excellent. So he learned skateboard moving. Skateboard stop. Um, stay. Um, so um, skateboard moving equals good things. Then we're going to wait when he's done and he looks. I'm going to move the skateboard a little bit. He looks and he's like, okay, mom, that was great. Can I have a treat now? He's like, sure, you can have a treat. You can do this with your dogs and you go for a walk and they go, oh, the dogs are scary. Help them relax, come out your house, move slower. When your dog's more relaxed, you walk down the street, they see a dog, they look at the dog because they're relaxed now. They're not just going to bark and scream. They're probably going to do what he's doing. And then you're gonna say, they're going to go, I'm done. And you go, here's a treat. And they go, I like watching other dogs. Good things happen. Excellent. Chirag is not going to try and ride the skateboard because Chirag will fall on his butt and then you will laugh at Chirag and so he will just do a little bit of movement. Nice. Give him a treat. Excellent. Is that okay? I'm okay with that. You can get a treat. Nice, and we'll stop there while he's on a good note. You can see if he wants to exit. It's like, no, thank you. I'm quite happy here. Did you notice both the dogs sniffed their toys when they came in? And um, the first um, dog actually st uh, stuck her head in the bowl and started drinking. Most times when dogs come into a new room, they don't drink straight away or in a training session. It's because they're, they're not, it's not familiar for them. So familiar objects really help create safety. And so also what the dogs learn is they can trust their humans because none of the humans that came in um, took trust away. None of them forced the dogs to do anything bad or anything the dogs didn't like. They kept the dogs safe. And so the dogs learn to trust their people. So um, what's next? Is this, yeah, hello. Um, that was awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we have about 10 minutes to ask uh, or answer some questions. Uh, uh, we have Shrag, who will answer questions, with myself, along with uh, Dr. Karen Van Haften, who's the BCSPCA Senior Manager of Animal Behavior and Welfare. Karen uh, studied at UC Davis Veterinary Medical Teaching, Hos Hosp Teaching Hospital, got it, and uh, before she joined us here at the BCSPCA and uh, in clinical behavior. So we're excited to have her. So we have to move over. <laughs> we have uh, people with microphones up top, Mandy and Jane. So if you have a question, they'll come over and you can ask your questions. And then down below, I'll pick some people and I'll repeat your questions for you. So should we start up top? Uh, hi. Uh, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old Woodle, Wheaton and uh, Poodle. When he turned two, he started being scared of things he's never been scared of. Walking in the same neighborhood, he'd see uh, the same garbage can, and all of a sudden he, he's skittish, um, and nothing's changed. We walk him where we've always walked him. We treat him the same way. We're wondering, is that a normal thing when they turn two, that they become nervous and scared of everything? Great, oh, great question. Dr. Karen, I think. That's Dr. A great Karen. One Dr. Karen. Okay. Um, there are a few critical stages in dog development. So the ones you've probably heard of are the socialization period, which follows the neonatal period. So um, it, it's in puppyhood, usually between two and four months of age. 
Um, then they reach sexual maturity around six months of age. And some people, there's not a ton of evidence on this, but you'll hear people talk about a second fear period, um, which is kind of in that young adolescent period. So more around seven to nine months, depending on, you said a woodle? Yeah. So medium, okay. Um, yeah, and then around a year and a half, two years of age, um, there's something called uh, social maturity. So from a human perspective, that would be more your teenage years where you're coming, kind of coming into adulthood, maybe a little bit more confident to say how you really feel about things, whereas when you're younger, you usually just tend to go with the flow. Um, so it's interesting you say around two years because um, in my clinical practice, the most common... Um, reason people would come see me with their dogs was um, either aggression or anxiety issues. And they would often develop around that year and a half, two years of age. It's kind of when um, their adult behaviors start to set in. So it's not an uncommon thing. There's, there's no magical um, mark around two years when dogs suddenly become anxious. I won't say that's a really common presentation, um, but two years is when we start to see some behavior changes in dogs. So it's interesting. I would, I would wonder, actually, and maybe Shrey can talk on this as well, if there was some other thing that happened around two years of age that was an inciting event. Sometimes it's things we don't even know about. I mean, I've had dogs have inexplicable anxiety in the home, and it turns out somebody two blocks away was doing construction with a jackhammer in their house. Like, they, their senses are so much more... Um, perceptive than ours are. They are listening to more things and smelling more things than we are. Um, also, are you with him 100% of the time? Pardon? Are you with him 100% of the time? Okay. Well, he's not here right now. Who's taking... Oh, what could... <laughs> Your husband, yeah. Okay. Okay, that's actually pretty unusual. For a lot of dogs, there's a period of time when they're alone and we're not monitoring their environment. So, yeah. It, the, at some point, it's academic to figure out why it happened. You know you have anxiety. We need to treat the anxiety. So that, that's the good part of your question is it doesn't really matter why it's here. <laughs> we need to treat it. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Shireg now. <laughs> sure. So, but I think, um, so what would you do, Kim, if he's backing away? If backing away from the garbage truck, yeah. Can. Garbage can. Garbage can. Well, I would start way back and give him exact, exactly what Shireg did here this evening. Give him choices and some control and let him choose if he wants to go near or even start if I'm 30 feet away and I notice that he's a little nervous. Give him a choice. Give him some treats, maybe go the other way. So I love that idea that Kim said, um, be watching so that um, you can pick up on the earlier signs. So if there might be small signs, like his ear changing, how his whiskers are held, how muscle tension, if you notice those beforehand, then to teach him rather than escalate forward, you can retreat back to a safe place. Um, and then in that moment, rather than trying to say, look at the garbage can, it's not that bad. If you're scared of a spider and someone's going, it's okay, look, he's fluffy. P say hello to Pinky. Pinky's okay. No, thank you. And he's like, no, thank you. No, you sure? Pinky's okay. And you're like, that makes you even more anxious. And so if your dog says, oh, garbage can, I need to move away, say, let's go away. And so support that behavior. And then I would say maybe even, um, and see what Dr. Karen's opinion on this is, but um, if there's a sudden change in behavior, one of the other reasons for sudden changes in behavior could be uh, physical. So is there pain or discomfort or something else going on as well? In a young animal, you'd hope not. But um, if suddenly an animal does change behavior overnight and there's no specific trigger for it or environmental change to make sure that there isn't any pain or any of those things going on. Great question. Thank you. We have five minutes. We have time for two more questions. We're going to go up here and then we'll come down. The second dog, when uh, you moved the skateboard closer. No, that's the only time I saw that he actually looked in the opposite direction and you retreated. So that was maybe a sign of the lower ladder telling, telling you it was too much pressure. 
Yeah, definitely. I would probably say I, um, that was a great observation. So I know it's the second time. Um, and I actually broke my own rules there because r rather than waiting for him to say, OK, I'm ready, I could have actually given him more control. So when he's finished and he looks in my direction, I could have moved the skateboard at that moment. So when I moved and he wasn't ready, yeah. he actually looked away. So yeah, that was I would interpret his behavior saying that's way too much. And so that's a really good observation. And so I, it's actually better to just wait for him to say, Okay, can you move that thing? And then he gets uh, a treat because he's ready to see it, um, rather than just moving it when he's not ready. Yeah. So it's almost like set you um, uh, um, for you to say, okay, um, Kim says, okay, you can move that spider a bit closer, as opposed to me just moving it when she's trying to turn away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Down here. Oh, so many people. I guess well, right here up front. You've been, I've been taught since I've been younger, and I, I tell all children when they approach a dog to put their hand down and let the dog smell them before they pat. Is that not the right thing to do? Um, I'd be interested to see what these guys think. My opinion is um, I would advise against it because the child being there is enough of a cue. Or anybody, yeah, because if a dog f perceives our movement as a threat, so if a guy's got a knife in his hand, and he just holds out his hand, but he's not trying to threaten you. But it's still a threatening motion. So if a dog could be threatened by a human, any movement is going to be threatening. And so if the dog wants to smell us, they've got all this body uh, to smell. But also, we're losing so many skin cells every second. So this floor is covered in my skin cells. Um, and so um, he's got so much of me he can smell. And so he doesn't need a threatening thing coming out, um, in my opinion. I, I babysit a dog, um, the guy that lives below me, for five years he's lived in the apartment, and just in the last year, I've come to realize that he's, this dog is by itself, for 10 year, by itself for 10 hours a day. So I volunteered to the owner to take the dog whenever I can, when he's working, out for, for toileting, walks, whatever. And, and when I'm home, he, he sits with me, he, he accompanies me. And when the owner's home, when I can't do it, and the owner's gone to work, I just want to know if I'm doing more harm to the dog. Then, you know. how, does, how do you think the dog feels? What does the dog tell you? The dog, when, when I come to get him and, and the owner's gone to work, he goes crazy. He howls. Arr! He runs down the hall. Arr! He's so happy to see me. Yeah, when he comes to my apartment, he will sit and drink for, I'm, I swear to God, 15, 20 seconds straight because he knows that I'm going to take him out for a pee. And, and same with his food. Like, when I go down to get his food, he's got a bowl full of food. He will not touch his food until I go up and, and I feed him, and he, and he knows I'm going to take him out. Mm -hmm. Whereas if, if his owner's, he doesn't eat his food all day until the owner comes home because he, he regulates himself with his water and his food because the owner's not there to take him out, yeah. you know? And, and, and I just want to know, am I doing him more harm than good? I mean, I, I, I feel for the dog, and I don't want to say anything to the owner because if I do, the owner's going to say, give me my key back, leave my dog alone. I think it's a really sweet thing you're doing. I think your intentions are obviously coming from the best possible place. Honestly, I feel like I'd have to know more about the whole lifestyle of that dog to comment. It sounds like at least your time with him is positive. Really sweet thing. <laughs> um, very good intentions. It doesn't sound like something that honestly would be a, a huge problem for the dog. D dogs do like having a daily schedule that's relatively consistent, we know that. Um, but having more positive time. When Shireg comes and has fun with us for a few days in Vancouver once every five years, it <laughs> no, it's more frequent than that. Um, it's, not, it's not that, I mean, we do miss him, but we don't sit around crying when he leaves Aww. either. <laughs> So, like, positive time is positive time, even Thank if it's you. not there all the time. Um, whether it's an issue for that particular dog depends on that particular dog's personality and issues. So, I feel like I'd have to know more. Yeah. It's really, it's really great of you to do that. Thank you. I'm getting, I'm getting cut off. I apologize. And I thank you all for coming tonight and speaking. Uh, this exciting, it's an exciting time for us tonight, uh, having our first uh, speaker series and having Shirag here speaking. Uh, we really enjoyed it. We thank you. Thank you. Uh, we thank all the, the volunteers that are here tonight helping us, and you know, especially for you guys coming out and spending your evening with us. Uh, thank you. Please drive safely.
We'll see you soon.